It's time for the Douglas Coleman Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From the entertainment industry to authors to political and social commentators. The famous and not so famous. The controversial and the light and fluffy. We have it all. Now, here's Douglas Coleman. Okay, please welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show, Ed McDonald. Hi, Ed. How are you? Well, I'm just fine, Douglas. Uh, thanks for asking. Well, thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Uh, I was just looking over your bio. Are you still in law enforcement? No, no. And uh, I should I should put a caveat on that. Otherwise, uh, all the full-time law enforcement guys would be offended. I was a reserve officer for five years, uh, which means I did about one year of full-time duty. And I wasn't actually, I was certified as an Arizona police officer, but I volunteered my time for five years, and uh, the guys who are real cops full-time for 20 years would be very offended if they thought I was passing myself <laughs> off as a retired oh, okay. police officer. <laughs> well, so what exactly, were you a, a writer, or an author, or your bio is sort of vague as to what exactly you have been doing with your life? Everything I could think of, I did. Uh, my, my, my motto for life has been go for it. And so uh, in the course of my life, I uh, was a uh, I was reserve officer, of course. Then I was a ski instructor. I was a scuba diving instructor and dive master. I, uh, I learned I have a pilot's license. I uh, worked for the t Final Option T Tactical Force Institute as their director of academic programs, their publications editor, published a bunch of, uh, of military manuals. Uh, CIA had a standing order for two copies of any book we produced. Um, I worked as a vol as a teacher volunteer on a, a, a congressional uh, staff for three summers, and during that time, I passed three resolutions through Congress each year to uh, make a national day dedicated to excellence in honor of the Challenger astronauts. And so we had that day in '87, '88, '89 on January 28th. We had congressional ceremonies, and we gave awards to outstanding employees and to students who had changed their lives from all over the United States. Also on your bio, it says that you lived in Russia, Mexico, and Kazakhstan. What were you doing there? Yeah. Well, in Mexico, I uh, was a dive master. I would go spend my summers down there on a 50-foot boat teaching people how to scuba dive. Okay. And uh, in uh, Kazakhstan, I was there for a couple of months uh, uh, chaperoning a, a, a high school student group from uh, Tucson. And uh, then in, I spent, uh, I've been to some, Russia a number of times because uh, I, uh, I went there as for a couple of months uh, one summer on uh, a study abroad program to, uh, to, to improve my Russian. And while I was there, I met my wife. And then having married her, we went back many summers uh, visiting the family. And so uh, I've got to, I've got two daughters who are native speakers in both English and Russian. Uh, I've forgotten how to speak it because my daughter, my wife, wife has me speaking English to them. What was uh, what was Kazakhstan like? I, I don't think I've ever met anybody who's been there. Well, you know, it was a surprise. Uh, for one thing, I was wrong. I thought that the Ch the Kazakh people were basically uh, Chinese, and they weren't. They're uh, they're Mongols, and I thought that they would be kind of hostile to Americans. Because uh, it's you know it's the middle of nowhere, yeah. And, and, but you know I got there and I found out that hospitality is the national motto, and I didn't meet anyone who wasn't kind to me. It was a big surprise, and I enjoyed my time there very much. Is it like Mongolia in this in the climate and the terrain? Is it very desert and but cold? Well, they have uh, they have the steppes, uh, you know, which is a great place to launch launch and retrieve uh, space shuttles from. Uh, but then they're, they're surrounded by a ring of mountains. I was in Almaty, which for many years was the capital, and outside of Almaty they had a ski area, and from the ski area you could look into China. Oh, okay. Is, what is the, I know it's a Muslim country, right? Yes, it is. It, what language do they speak there? Well, um, it's like this. They speak mostly Russian because they were uh, subject to the Soviet rule for right. 70 years. Yeah. And there, there's a big movement there for, for the young people to learn to speak the Kazakh language, which was almost extinct. And if the Soviet Union had lasted 10 more years, there wouldn't have been anybody around who still spoke Kazakh. 
So, okay, so primarily the, the language still is Russian. Russian, and a lot of people speak English. A lot of people speak English, okay. So you've written a book called Korea's Game, and when did you write this book? Well, I wrote it uh, in 19, uh, uh, 19, <laughs> in 2017, and I originally self-published it as a cyber war attack, and uh, I... Uh, Got the book polished and finished and just fine and got it distributed, but I didn't have any money to market it. And if you don't market a book, it's like you didn't publish it. So after a couple of years went by, I got professional help and I uh, spoke to an agent and uh, he said, well, first of all, you need a more international name. Uh, people are, the screenplay writers now, are, uh, producers are looking for things that sh show interaction between nations. So I changed the title to... Uh, Korea's game, and I added a uh, a first chapter which would serve as the uh, uh, part of the video for a uh, titles, and I added a last chapter which would serve as video for uh, credits at the end of a movie, and I got a uh, a well known screenwriter to write it as a screenplay, and sh she's someone who's done a lot of uh, published a lot of movies. Uh, she most recently she did Driver, and. Uh, so something coming from her, I think, is likely to get some attention from uh, producers. Uh, I just produced a uh, a uh, sizzle reel, and you say, well, you know, what is a sizzle reel? It's uh, it's about a, th a two or three minute uh, preview of a movie that hasn't been made yet. And uh, when you send a screenplay to a producer, these guys are busy and they have closets full of unread screenplays. So you have to send them a sizzle reel, and they can take two minutes and look at that, that preview, and, and that, that'll give them an idea of, is this something that I want to get involved with, or is this just another bad movie? And uh, so I've got the sizzle reel out, and right now I'm in the middle of a, of a promotional push to find, trying to try and find a real publisher, uh, a name publisher for the book, and a producer for the movie. And of course, our, in the current climate, Everybody's goal is to get uh, one of the cable, streaming cable companies to pick up a book because uh, there's a, a, there's an awful lot of money in streaming cable. Sure there is, yeah. Well, I've got a 500-page book, so it was easy to get a lot of chapters out of it. So I, when I, when we, uh, after we uh, got the screenplay made and the sizzle reel done, I divided it into 12 episodes, and I wrote a page for each episode outlining it. And so we, sent the, we were sending the book out with the screenplay and the proposal for 12 episodes. And we're hoping one of the c cable companies will uh, look at the episodes and pick it up. And uh, here's a bit of trivia that people might be interested in. When you make a book proposal or a screenplay proposal, everybody's interested in sequels. So you write what's called a, uh, a, a proposal Bible. And uh, what that means is you, uh, you list the sequels that are to come, what they're called and uh, what the basic outline of each sequel is. So they can, when they can look at it, they say, okay, book one is interesting, but what follows it? And uh, because they're all thinking about the next movie and the next movie, because if it's popular, then they want to have their hands on it and uh, get rake in the money from the, uh, the sequels. Uh, that's very true. Yeah, I'm kind of familiar with the screenplay game. I've written a couple uh, myself. I haven't written a novel though, and I know it's two different, two different creatures entirely. Writing a novel, it's almost the opposite of each other. One is a lot of words, and one is very little words <laughs> to basically describe oh, yeah. the same thing. You know, it's a, it's a diff whole different mindset. But um, well, okay, that sounds interesting. So I guess the next question is: Tell us what it's about. It's about a guy who's got trouble, and he's got more trouble than he realizes. Uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a former Army Ranger. He's won the Silver Star. He's an important, important got nice guy. But he's very modest. Most people don't know anything about him. And uh, his, uh, comes from a, uh, he was disowned by his family because his uh, father was a pacifist and uh, actually was un not proud of him for winning a Silver Star. And so he a little confused about whether he's a good guy or not. So he doesn't. He never talks about his past, and he's a civil servant. His job is uh, preparing. Is a, he's from the director of emergency preparations, and he's to see to it that if there's a disaster, that his uh, his township is ready for it. And uh, he personally is d deeply concerned that America is going to be the subject of a cyber attack from North Korea, and he's trying to get people in uh, to do things that would mitigate 
the, the effects of such a disaster. A disaster like that, you know, it's not going to go away. Everybody thinks uh, a cyber attack means lights go out, the army comes in, fixes everything, and a week later we're all back in business. But a real cyber attack would put us out of business for more like 10, 12, or 15 years uh, because it would crash hundreds of these big transformers that are in, that are set up like dominoes across the country. You know, when one crashes, it crashes the next one, and it crashes the next one. And each one costs more than a million dollars. Uh, each one, is uh, 75% of them are made in Europe, and uh, it takes a, over a year to get one, and it costs millions of dollars to get it, and then it has to be transported in a freighter, put on a special train, put on a special truck, taken there, installed, it takes forever to get a new one in, and then you've got one, and now there's like 400 more in a row to go. Uh, so you're talking about years and years to get a line, uh, uh, to get the system back up. Uh, no, nobody wants to think about that because it's so, it's, uh, there's no simple solution, and uh, the idea is so terrifying, they don't want the public to think about it. This is yeah, cyber right. attack, meaning uh, online, or is this uh, like infrastructure, like electricity? Uh, it's online. Uh, there's there's two ways for a cyber attack to be set up. One is to to basically hack into an existing system, which in, in some parts of our cable sys our our system would be very easy to hack into. Another way to do it is to uh, take control of one of the companies that provides some of the microchip circuit boards that would be used in constructing one of these systems, and out of uh, like. I don't know, say, uh, say there's a million chips on a board, you take one chip and you put a piece of malware in there that there would be no simple way to test for it. And so you have these circuit boards all over the place, and each one of them has one piece of malware in it, and if it gets the right code, it says destruct, destruct, destruct. Uh, so you could have, uh, there's uh, two ways to go about this, and probably there are, four, there are four, foreign agents going about both ways. Uh, at this time, it's pretty well conceded by the people who know that uh, there are four uh, external agents who are prepared to do this, and that's China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea. China and, and Russia, there's no way they're going to do it because we know they did it, and we would, we would respond with nuclear force. Uh, Iran, they wouldn't do it unless they were in the middle of a revolution and they looked like they were all going to get killed anyway. Uh, that's not too likely. Uh, but in North Korea, you have a leader who's unstable and who is constantly being told that he is, uh, he, not only is he God's answer, but he is actually God himself. And he could, he could be persuaded to believe that he could do this and get away with it. And uh, he wouldn't get away with it, but he only has to think he would get away with it to, for him to do it. And that's what my book is based on, is that idea. You're listening to Mr. Smooth and Savvy right here on The Douglas Coleman Show. We'll be right back after these commercial messages. DJC Music and DJC Productions are pleased to announce a brand new website. We have started a listing website for radio show hosts as well as potential show guests. This is a meeting site where hosts and guests can come together. Show hosts can list their show and types of guests they're interested in booking. Potential guests can list their talents, bio, accomplishments, or anything they feel makes them an interesting radio show guest. There are no recurrent payments, only a one-time $5 listing fee. Your listing will stay up until you decide to cancel. Previous guests of The Douglas Coleman Show are welcome to submit their guest listing free of charge. Go to radiohostsandguests.com. That's radiohostsandguests.com. Love coffee, huh? But wait a minute. It seems like every time you finish a cup of coffee, you get all of these side effects along with it. Heartburn, digestion, upset stomach, acid reflux. As the world's first and only organic acid-free coffee, Tyler's Coffee is able to provide a healthier option in the solution for more than 100 million individuals who have sensitive stomachs or suffer from acid-related modalities. This is Tyler's Acid-Free Coffee. Coffee without the consequences. Are you an independent musician? 
How would you like to have your songs played on hundreds of radio stations just like the one you're listening to right now? Join MusicSubmit.com and we'll promote your music to radio stations and blogs in your genre. It's free to set up your account and we guarantee your music will be considered for airplay by radio stations worldwide. Why not sign up today? It's free. MusicSubmit.com. Radio promotion for indie musicians. Hey, hey, this is Ray Powers. Don't touch anything. You've got it right where you need it. Tuned in to the Douglas Coleman Show. You heard me. I've always wondered what gain would Kim Jong-un have to attack the United States? Uh, first of all, there's just the whole business of ego and that we've, uh, we've, we've been pushing North Korea around and uh, not really uh, in any inappropriate way. But uh, they're very sent these. They're very, very. You got a person here who's very proud, and uh, it, to the point of it being like a, a mental problem. And so uh, he feels he has to, would have to just show us that you know you, you can't push me around. The other thing is America is the big kid on the block, and if America were taken out, there would be a lot of room uh, for uh, uh, other countries that are dominated by a single single leader to step up and uh, increase their real estate, increase their power, increase their uh, their income. Uh, now, the big benefic- beneficiaries, of course, would be China and Russia. But, you know, uh, a lot of people, a lot of countries in the Middle East would be happy. North Korea would be happy. Uh, none of them would be going against him for doing this. They'd all celebrate him, and he'd probably have a lot more influence. Uh, he'd be able to make more money. But, yeah, if he could get away with it, it would be great for him. So essentially, he could get a promotion on the World Theater uh, (laughs) if he were to take out the United States. I think that puts it very well, yes. Yeah, okay. And so you, you know, uh, you know, people, when you start thinking about something over and over, you become obsessed with it, you can talk yourself into believing anything. It's an interesting concept, and, you know, it doesn't sound like it's that far away from possible. I think, I think it is possible, you know? Oh, yeah, it could happen today. That's what scares me. I uh, I got a lot of my information from Ted Koppel's book, uh, Lights Out, and he explains uh, the American uh, power grid and how vulnerable it is and how it's built, who owns it, and where its weaknesses are. And by the time I was through reading that book, I was terrified. And uh, because it was so factually based, it's not the kind of book that it attracts a lot of people to read it. And I thought somebody has got to take this information and make it available to people. The best way would probably be through fiction, because people like fiction, and, they, and you can absorb knowledge while you're enjoying a fictional story. And that's, what decided, that's why I decided to write this kind of a thriller. Have we, um, we as in our government, done anything to secure this, our infrastructure, our, uh, you know, any of these to protect against a cyber attack? A major portion of the uh, of our grid is owned by some very powerful, uh, wealthy companies, and they have the money to uh, to do a lot of uh, cybersecurity. Uh, but then there's a there's another portion of the web that of uh, the grid that is owned by lesser companies that are not wealthy, and they don't have the money to do that kind of protection. And the thing is, is you only need one crack to get in, and once somebody is in, and once they crash. Uh, the transformers and in, in one per, in one uh, uh, company's grids, it's the row of dominoes keeps going into the place that should be protected from it uh, and is, but nonetheless, the crash is coming from uh, next door. Uh, now, our nation, in terms of what the nation is doing, I have no I have no way of knowing because that's that all that would be secret uh, because this is we're talking about such an incredible danger to the country that anything they're doing about this, uh, if they admit they're doing it. They are, in effect, advertising how vulnerable we are, right? And yeah. they don't—they don't want to do that. And uh, and I don't want to help any of our enemies by doing that either. I'm uh, I'm trying to uh, I'm playing chicken little, running around saying the sky is falling, because I uh, I want the government and I want individual companies to get uh, really busy on the cyber protection. And uh, exactly the details of how that would work are secret, and I don't know the secrets, and I don't want to know them. Because a lot of times, if a, if a writer knows something, it can slip into your story, and you're not even aware you've let it slip in because you just intimated it without saying it. But people who are reading it critically, they can they can see what you're hinting at. So I don't want to do that. 
Well, we probably shouldn't speculate too much on it anyways, because uh, like you said, we'd be giving it away. People do listen to podcasts and <laughs> and, and better well, that they read your book, I think, is, is more of an appropriate way to push them to find out more well, information. The book, you know? the book offers a, not a solution, but a mitigation. That is to say, we can't really solve this problem unless, you know, that's, a, that's an issue for the government or for a consortium of, uh, of grid owners. But we can mitigate it by uh, distributed power. And that by that, I mean encouraging anyone who can have their own power to have their own power. And, of course, that's largely uh, in the province of millionaires or very much upper-middle-class people to do it for themselves. But as you, as you do these things, the price drops. It's like solar cells. Uh, Twenty years ago, solar cells were strictly for the fil- filthy rich. Now, any middle-class person can have solar cells on their roof because the price has dropped. Right. The, uh, and the price of the controllers has dropped. The same thing will happen with uh, uh, distributed power. And when we talk about distributed power, you mean microgrids. And, uh, like, the Caterpillar company sells microgrids to people who are going to do construction jobs in the Amazon, and they're in the middle of nowhere, and then they, uh, they have ready-to-go microgrid trans- transports, you know, fly, fly it in, put it down, turn it on. Um, now, those are expensive, but uh, the, more you, the more you make of them, the cheaper they get. You can make them smaller, and, uh, you know, this is the great thing about America, is there's enormous ingenuity in this country, and anybody who has an idea for something can make it put it up for sale, and if it's a good idea, they can get rich. So if we, uh, if we start push promoting micro, microgrids, people will come up with better, cheaper ways to make them. And as they get better and as they get cheaper, more people will buy them. And so you'll ha- find that the, every, police, every police station would have one. So if the, if, uh, if the power goes out all over the country, you can still call the police and get a cop uh, come chase the people out of your backyard. Uh, fire departments should have them. So uh, if your house is on fire, you can still call the fire department, and they'll show up. Uh, hospitals. Yeah. Now, hospitals all have generators, but those generators are only good for as long as they have fuel, which is like a week, a month, whatever. Uh, they really need microgrids, something like the solar and wind power that can last for, for years. Uh, but they don't want to think about that because it's more expensive, and uh, you know, who knows? Who knows what will happen in a real disaster? Well... One thing for sure, in a real disaster, we would need hospitals. Uh, my, I, you know, all of these uh, uh, go-to-it emergency uh, care centers should have their own power. Uh, yeah, the, the, in any city of any size, their, their water system should have its own uh, microgrid so that if the, if the power goes down, people can still get water. Uh, now, uh, I, actually, I would like to see really big shopping centers have their own microgrids. Now, they would have to do this as an act of uh, patriotism or charity because they're not going to make any money on it. But uh, they would provide an island of safety for people who could come and buy a hot dog and get a drink and get out of the heat and get into the air conditioning or out of the, out of the snow and get into the warmth. Um, and that would just be a charitable act on their part. But the more that we make distributed power available, the cheaper it'll get and the more places will adopt it. Will that stop a, a, a grid crash? No, but it'll make the the uh, the disaster of a grid crash less disastrous. Well, that's very true. Uh, Ed, we do have to wrap this up. Do you have a website that you want to give out that people can check oh, out? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it's www, and then uh, the word author, and that's not the name Arthur. It's the name, it's author, the person who writes a book, A-U-T-H-O-R, author, Ed McDonald, all one word, dot com. And there you'll, uh, you can uh, find uh, a lot of the details about uh, the book. And uh, as I said, uh, it's, still, it's still available in all the, uh, in all the usual places as a cyber war attack, because uh, I haven't republished it under, under the name, uh, sorry, Korea's Game yet. But uh, we have all the information about the book. And also the sizzle, sizzle reel is available. You can get, get a preview of what I'd be showing to movie producers, trying to get them to buy the book or to buy the screenplay. I'm kind of hoping that uh, book, re- book producers would look at the sizzle reel because, you know, they're not real big on reading manuscripts either. Uh, and uh, so you'll, you'll see what, what, how, you know, what, a promotion, what a real promotion looks like for someone who has a book for sale. And, of course, you know, here I am on the air. 
I'm going to, I'm going to be doing a lot of uh, interviews for the next couple of months, and I'm, uh, I'm hoping that uh, somebody's executive assistant will be driving their car, listening to this, and saying, maybe we should look at this guy's book, maybe we should look at this guy's screenplay. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's, the, that's the thought that makes me smile at night. <laughs> Well, let's hope so, because I think it's real interesting, and I, I think it would make a great movie. I mean, it's uh, definitely something that is uh, thought-inspiring oh, you know, and, and a bit terrifying for people, but that's always what makes a good thriller. You know, I did leave uh, something out here. There's, uh, uh, we talked about how vulnerable we are to cyber attack. We talked about the importance of renewable and distributed energy. One of the other big elements of the, of the, of the, of the book is uh, the fact that... Uh, this guy's daughter is a couple hundred miles away, and he's uh, separated from his wife. He's not supposed to go and visit. He, uh, he, t- he texts his daughter. He's not aware that his wife is intercepting the texts and texting back as, as the daughter. And uh, the wife's boyfriend is uh, pushing this da- the, the daughter to go into the sex trade. And she is the last person you would ever think would be in the sex trade. She wants nothing to do with it, but the thing is, when you have young girls, young boys, when you have young people, they need people to protect them. They need people to look out for them. And in this case, no one is looking out for her. None of the, none of the, none of the people who should be watching her are watching her. And this guy is just dragging her, kicking and screaming, into dancing at a bar. And he has very clear plans about what he wants to lead into. And she's telling him, no, I would never do that. But he knows he can put her in a situation where she has to. And so as you're reading this... You're seeing this guy fighting the good fight down in Arizona, and uh, and at the same time, you see his daughter get encroached upon and menaced in uh, northern Arizona, and he has no clue. And you could you could kind of get the idea from his military background that if he knew, you you really wouldn't want to mess with him. And so throughout the whole book, you're just waiting to see, hey, what's going to happen here? And so. Um, uh, that adds a lot of extra tension uh, to the book, probably more tension than the actual attack does. Well, thank you for coming on the show and sharing about your book and about your life. Uh, best of luck. I hope to see this as a film on somewhere, Netflix, Amazon, one of those. I think this would be a great series. Well, bless your heart, Douglas. That's two of us now. I just need to recruit a couple more. <laughs> thank right. you very much. Take care. It's real pleasure. real pleasure to have been here.